These are the sort of itches I'm going to, going to scratch, um, hopefully just a little. I've got, only got sort of 20 minutes, so I'll get through this um, relatively quickly, particularly on the bits that have been touched on um, before. Terminology. I think uh, James, is James still here? Okay. Um, he uh, talked about um, issues and crisis earlier. I just want to sort of touch on that a bit more. Um, do they, does terminology um, matter? I think it's sort of yes, yes and no. Um, I don't, it's, for me, it doesn't matter what the term is, but if you've got to have one and stick with it. And I don't know if anyone sort of knows the difference why there's some in red and some in blue. The red ones are all on the program today. Do they mean the same thing? Are we in a disaster? Are we in an emergency? Are we in a crisis? <coughs> and I think that matters in an organization that everybody knows. If someone's talking about an emergency and someone else is talking about a crisis, the same thing. That's not a great place to be. Uh, I've thrown it the other two. For instance, a major incident is one that the emergency services in the UK um, use. Big crash on the motorway, first sort of emergency service person there can declare a major incident. That's one I think organisations shouldn't use, but the rest, you know, take your pick. But at least once you've decided on it, make sure everyone sits with it, otherwise they don't understand exactly what state you're in. And so James did talk about uh, their definitions. I've put up there the ones from the British Standard 11200, um, and I think they're quite um, pertinent. See the instance up there, might be a bit of a sort of link with the issue. It's sort of what I'd use below the bar and can be dealt with under normal practices, normal procedures, normal sort of staff. Uh, and then there's the crisis, something that you know might threaten strategic objectives, your reputation, we'll come back to that. Um, in a moment. And then crisis management, the sort of processes for dealing with um, a crisis. But I actually like these definitions, and you'll notice the words slightly different. You've got incident and critical incident here. I think, and I, hopefully you can see it come out in bold, the incident can be managed through local management sort of procedures. Critical incident can't, so we stand up some different structure and funny old thing, you might well have a plan for that. Because to be honest, if you're in an issue or a crisis, if you just use the same structure and the same processes, does it matter? The issue that we, we deliver, we talk about a lot, is someone's in a crisis mode, or whatever term they use, and they generally get out a plan called a crisis management plan, whatever it is, and slightly stripped different structures come together. And we'll just look at some of those um, in a moment. And of course, the difference is recognizing when you've tipped from one to the other, when you've got out of that sort of issue, the sort of incident management, and we're all in crisis now. And if you don't make that clear initially, you will do that. Again, we'll return to that in a moment. Some of the impacts from a, from a crisis just worth um, sort of looking at. You could put a whole bunch more there, some much more relevant to the procurement space. But you will recognise all of them. So if you worry about these sort of things, the sort of impacts that might come from a crisis, you do feel an organisation needs to do something about it. And of course, if you throw that one at the bottom left, then you really have to suggest you do want to do something about it because no one wants to be um, without a job. And on that note, mention I did stuff with the Olympics, so my final three years actually I was still in uniform, so I did actually tip over the sort of 30 years. I was working um, with the Home Office, head of the Prepare Programme. Olympic Prepare Program, worried about high end threats and hazards to the Olympic Games, working funny enough for Theresa May. Um, and this big thing happened G4S, looking to sort of deliver in a procurement sense the security man guarding uh, component. And as we all probably remember, that all went a bit pear shaped not too long before, before the event. And of course, if you end up in this sort of position now, if you can sort of read that, you know, you're in front of um, Parliament, one of their committees. <coughs> And look at the words used, humiliating shambles and reputation of G4S is in tatters. Actually, quite remarkably, G4S is still around, still doing very well. I think it's the third largest employer in the world, 670,000 employees. And remarkably, it's come out of that situation, probably not as bad as people might have thought. However, they got it right, how big might they be um, uh, today? At least one of the speakers talked earlier about, about risk. Lots of people have you know, spreadsheets covered in loads of lists, um, and loads of risks. 
may have some detail about what that specific risk means. Our experience working with clients is quite often that's good for a sort of audit. Have you got a list of risks? Yeah, we've got them. They can put it out. They can show it. The key thing is, do they do anything about it? Do they link that to the sort of processes, particular in a crisis sense? And often we find not. Perhaps simpler to sort of get the point across, particularly in the boardroom, to put them on a matrix. I'm assuming a lot of people have used these sort of uh, tables, and you plot the risks. Now, if you've got them in the top right-hand corner, except the sort of grading fives, one to five on the bottom, um, likelihood of uh, one to five up the left-hand uh, axis there for impact, if you've got a lot in the red, you're in a pretty scary place. There are risks that you worry about, you should therefore do something about them. Hopefully, reduce the level of that risk. Drive them, if you can, down to the bottom left-hand corner. So you reduce the likelihood, reduce the impact. If you've got nothing on that chart, then you probably don't need to worry about crisis, crisis management plans and such like. But if you have got a, a risk matrix that looks like that, and you can't drive them out and off the bottom left-hand corner, then you're in not a great place. You assume the likelihood's quite high, those ones in the red, you know, on the likelihood scale, it looks quite likely. So therefore, question, what are you doing about it? Have you thought about how you respond if one of those were actually to happen? And it's surprising how many people get this far, but then don't look at the so what and take it on from there. Bit of um, audience participation, I know, just a quick survey. Won't be published, uh, and I won't be sending you, you know, um, um, literature following on from you answering the survey. So just a quick show of hands if people would be would be honest on this. How many of you involved in a major crisis at work? Okay, three, four, four or so. Okay, not many. How many got a crisis management plan? Okay. <laughs> okay. Not not uh, again. Not not that many. Uh, how many thinks the plan, those who've got them, are fit for purpose? Okay. Couple. Numbers have gone down even more. When did you last conduct an exercise in this year? You don't want this year. One. Okay. Same. So, okay. So it looks like people with the plans are doing exercises. I don't feel they're well placed to respond to a crisis. <coughs> Quite often with these sort of questions, the numbers at the, the first question are high, and as you get near the bottom, you actually don't feel that good about it. Well, you, if you go back to the sort of risks that you might face, and you go back to the impacts that, that might occur from those, and people go, yeah, I really do worry about these things, and then you ask, well, why haven't you got a plan? Why isn't it fit for purpose? Why haven't you exercised? And then quite often it becomes a tick box thing. You ask people, they've done exercise, oh yeah, we did one about three years ago, there's an already coming up to be good one. In our view, that isn't good enough. These are sort of things you need to do. Um, be ready. For those who haven't faced a crisis, I thought probably just worth putting um putting up some sort of nature, the nature of the characteristics. And just you can see now I'm going to go through them all. Certainly they're complex. They're scary if you've not been in one. They happen very quickly. You, the, the, the wave comes and sort of washes you away if you're not careful. The fourth one from the bottom, cross boundary. In a lot of organisations, people work in their stovepipes. Fact, fact of life, they might have a few meetings with colleagues from other areas. In a big crisis, you do need to work cross-boundary. So it helps if you exercise and you write plans together, you get to know people in other, in other departments, other areas of business, so that everybody can then come together rapidly. And of course, they can be um, prolonged. I was talking to someone um, who was in the, the uh, theatre, the Apollo Theatre, if you remember, remember the, the ceiling sort of collapsed on people in the audience below. One individual in that theatre, I think, for the next 18 months, that's all he did was the aftermath of dealing with this after that, that sort of incident. That became his day job, that sort of long term crisis management um, problem. And of course, it gets, it gets worse. Um, we'll talk about information overload a little bit more. We had that earlier. Um, diagnosis, I think, was the, uh, was the term that Chris used. That's absolutely key, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. It certainly involves people. Do you know how your people, and if you're a manager, CEO, do you know how your people will react in a crisis situation? The problem answer is they don't really. And people do act very differently in a crisis to how they act in, in um, 
happens on the metal bar. Uh, and you can see reputational damage on the bottom there again. How do they pan out? You can see that. In a typical crisis, um, James talked about an issue, you can sort of see it coming. Well, this is sort of more in the crisis space. That sort of unexpected suddenly happens. You know, is, is this exactly how it happens? No, but normally you're behind the power curve. The crisis starts and grows very quickly, as it sort of demonstrates on there. The organisation response, on the other hand, is much slower. It's difficult to get off the mark. And that first bit of the green, where you can see that sort of a fairly flat line, that, if you like, you could describe as the dither space. Are we in a crisis or are we not? Is this big enough to stand up a new structure, to have a crisis management meeting with the CEO in the room? Um, talk talk when they had their, uh, their, their sort of hacking issue. How quickly did they stand up their crisis team, the senior team? I think pretty quickly. Uh, I think the CEO went out you know, publicly I can't remember how, how many hours, or maybe other tell me, but very quickly to say, you know, hands up, they're not really sure about this. So that sort of bottom bottom left corner on the green there was probably a bit sort of bit uh, um, sharper and steeper. And really, you want to get the green line as close to the blue line as you possibly can. The other thing I point out, and this, we always suggest organisations plan for at least 48 hours in serious crisis mode. And you heard from Jane this morning about media, social media. It's a 24-hour battle. So 24, 7, 48 hours is the planning guideline that we give as a minimum for any crisis. Because if you are looking toward the next day, the media headlines, they're, they're, they're sort of merging overnight, first thing in the morning, CEOs or whoever might be in front of the media at 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. And certainly ministers always used to worry about that. You know, 9 o'clock, they get to the Who's going to prepare the material that helps them deliver the right media message? It starts who are in the 24 7 cycle who are working overnight to provide those lines, they just don't magically appear. So that's our guideline 24 7 48, 48 hours. Um, constant time, I just want to talk briefly. These are the sort of components, if you like. If anything in a crisis can broadly, in a response sense, fit under um, those um, bullets there. I'm just going to pick up on, on one or two. Uh, the top one. The activity at the scene, in inverted commas, it could be an online scene, it could be some hacking, it could be away from your um, from your main location. Um, we do a lot in the education space, and they obviously send a lot of pupils away and coaches for, for visits. And you can have a coach crash, so it could be in a coach crash somewhere else, or it could be um, on your site. How often, or how how well versed are people at as soon as the crisis happens, they tell someone up the chain that it's happened, and therefore they can get the cult in motion. Vice trying to sort put the fire out for too long until it overwhelms them and then they shout six hours later. That's not a good place to be. So do organizations tell people the first thing you say is help, I'm now putting the fire out. But because you've shouted help, someone has got the sort of backup uh, support in motion. Um, stakeholders, uh, James mentioned this morning, identify your stakeholders. In a crisis, it's normally there are a lot more. It's broader, it's wider, it's deeper. If you haven't done a bit of crisis thinking around certain risks, particularly the ones you might have in your risk matrix, how do you know you're communicating and bringing in the relevant stakeholders to respond to a particular crisis? I won't say about that communications, but James did a lot on that. <coughs> the middle one, though, information management. That took to us, to me, I've worked across just about every sector now since we've been uh, in business. Information management is where they get it wrong. You have to develop shared situational awareness to be able to respond appropriately. Most times, and you ask the question about data, there's lots of information out there in the company space. They just can't get it in the boardroom, for want of a better term. They don't get the right people around the table because they haven't got a crisis plan. When you, when you have a crisis meeting, have we got the right people from the organisation? Have they got the right data to bring in around the table? <coughs> Uh, I don't want to uh, make uh, too much of a point of, of one particular incident, but the Lufthansa air crash, um, very clearly very sad event. Um, how quickly did the CEO, when that aircraft crashed, go out publicly and say, said all our pilots are 100% fit to fly? How much longer after that did it appear perhaps that wasn't quite the case? And that particular pilot did have some problems, and there were some medical issues involved, and perhaps. Had they got the right people in around that table in the first instance, someone might have said, boss, don't go out and say that. 
I'm, I'm surmising, I don't know the detail, but that's a sort of example of where the data might have existed, wasn't brought in around the table. And we do a lot of exercises with companies and what have you, and because the big excuse is I've seen an exercise, for real the information will be there. Even on an exercise, most times the information is there, they just haven't got the wherewithal to bring it down the table. I need to move on, I'm conscious of time. Just wanted to make a couple of points on um, planning, the planning process. A lot of companies use um, business continuity teams and, and similar teams to do their crisis management planning, mm -hmm. produce a plan. Because everyone's got a day job that they talk about, but they haven't got time to get involved in, in coming up with a crisis management plan. The best way to get teams and companies able to respond is get the people who are actually going to do the response to get involved in the plan. That is the way to, to beat um, the problem. And of course, that helps put in a framework that enables a good um, response. Last couple of points that I made. Why practice? To give you some chance of success, and it probably helps the ripple effect. If you can stand up quickly when a crisis occurs, one of the key things you're trying to do is to stop it spreading. I use the word ripple effect. If I, you know, the pebble in the pond, the ripples spread out. If you stand up quickly, people know what they're doing, you manage the crisis well, you will reduce the, the, the width, the depth um, of the crisis impact on your organisation. And the biggest bugbear, particularly when you're looking to write plans, do crisis training, you suffer like pleasure, I'm too busy. I use the example of the chap in the theatre. It becomes your day job, everyone's day job, including the CEO's biggest day job, when the crisis happens. And yet, can you get them to come and exercise and help write plans and ask you to do what they want to do? To me, that's a poor excuse, and they need to communicate more quickly. Last um, couple of points, perhaps last point really. I just thought I'd share this with you. 89% of companies have a crisis plan. That's still one in 10 that doesn't. That's absolutely amazing to me. And that 10% need to close that gap. Um, some it's the exception rather than the, than the rule when it comes to conducting an annual exercise. Seen in the room here, numbers are quite low. Of that 60%, only half involve the chief exec. If you don't get the boss in the room, the chances are you won't get the key staff in the room. Best thing we had during the Olympic training exercising, ministers turned up. I was the exercise director for the pre olympic <laughs> exercise, we ran three of them, the longest one for 72 hours, 24-7. We had COBRA meetings, cabinet office briefing group meetings around potential crises that would have happened, might have happened during the Olympics, chaired by all the ministers, the ministers were in the room. That tends to bring all the officials and everyone else, if ministers don't turn up, you don't bother, you don't bother um, playing, so get the CEO involved. And the final comment, <coughs> a key disruptor, if the CEO doesn't, doesn't play in getting your organisation prepared for crisis, whether it's involved, involving a procurement issue or frankly any other issue, I think this thing is that's all I've got to, uh, to say. I hope that was a good summary.